الله الرحمن الرحيم صلاة والسلام على خاطر الأنبياء سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم and welcome this is the fourth in a series of like media TV that it's been really fun and exciting to do I started on Tuesday at uh, Bart's Medical University and then we were in Leicester and Kiel yesterday and we're closing it up today at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And since I studied political science 500 years ago, <laughs> I feel very excited to be here as, uh, as the last stop in the series. To, as a matter of introduction, my name is actually Tamara, rhymes with camera, Tamara Gray. And uh, I'm a convert. I became a Muslim in 1985. I'm a grandmother. My, I was born before most of your mothers. And uh, I, um, I just finished my doctorate in leadership as well. After I did my master's degree in education, I went to Syria. I lived there for 20 years. Because, and I studied Islamic studies there and got a bunch of different uh, whatever, I mean, I studied Islamic studies, Quran and Arabic and the kinds of things that you study on that road. And then in 2012, because of the war, I went back to the United States and uh, started a whole new life really, because I hadn't really intended to leave Syria, but because of the war we did. Anyone here uh, from Syria? No, yes, no, no. Um, so we left and I moved back to Minnesota, that's where I'm from. And Minnesota is where I first saw Star Wars in the 1970s. That's a really long time ago. And those are the very first three movies. Now, I, I'm pretty, I have a feeling or from the talking to some of the ladies that not everyone here has seen Star Wars. So show me, give me a show of hands of those of you who've seen it. OK, so we have a few. All right, for the rest of you, let me just give you one of the reasons why we're talking about Star Wars today and give you a little bit of context for why Star Wars is an interesting metaphorical place to talk about and think about some of the different concepts and ideas that we've been thinking about this week. Star Wars was written originally George Lucas when he wrote Star Wars. He said that one of the things he hoped to do with Star Wars was to get young people, this is in the 70s, to get young people to think again about God, to give them the opportunity to rethink and give God, I mean, give God a chance, so to speak, give God in their life a chance. And so the first three movies, which were written in the 70s, and for the 70s had amazing uh, effects and things like that. I met the, um, I don't think I told you guys this, I met the person who does all of the Star Wars effects when I was in Malaysia. We were on a stage together and we did a talk together. In fact, he tried to fix my PowerPoint, but he couldn't. It was a pretty sad day. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, but so, yes, so in the, the, the original movie, if you look at it, it's really quite interesting in how the force is built up and how Jedis are described and the whole sort of idea behind the dark side and the light side and things like this. Then the next three movies were made in the 90s. Now, most Star Wars fans, if you talk to them about the, those next three movies, they give you a little bit of an eye roll, and they make sure that you don't like them more than the first three. But they'll, we all put up with them because they tell sort of a backstory. And now we have these new, uh, the last three movies of which the last one is coming out this month. And we're all wondering, who are Ray's parents? And what is who, the rise of Skywalker? What does that mean? And everyone is upset, of course, that Carrie Fisher died. And so we thought she wasn't going to be in this movie, but she is in the movie. So we're all, the Sky, Star Wars people are happy about that. Anyway, so the, the framework that we've been talking about, we've been looking at all sort of different aspects of spirituality and life this week. And the title of this week's talk is Leadership and Lightsabers. You guys want to? Squish in here, you can sit down. It's just easier for us all. Um, the talk for today is called Leadership and Light Sabers. Of course, for those of you who don't know, a lightsaber is the weapon of the Jedi. And the Jedi, we were talking over here a minute ago, there are two different po capacities or capabilities or ways to access the Force. Because today we're talking about leadership, we're going to focus today 
on the concept of the Jedi. So Jedis are those who can access the Force for good. And their weapon is this lightsaber, which is really, if you think about it, very old fashioned, because we're really in the future, the whole universe, it's the global universe, and people have the Death Star. I mean, there are terrible, terrible, horrible <laughs> weapons available for people. And these Jedis have nothing but a light sword. The Sith are the opposite of the Jedis, and the Sith only come in twos. There can only be two at a time. And those two are access what's called the dark side of the force. Now when I talk about this, or as we speak about this from an Islamic perspective, there are a couple of things we need to make note of. First of all, of course, we all remember it's just a movie. So it's just a metaphor. But at the same time, the metaphor is so interesting. Because here, the, the number of Jedi possibilities are unlimited. You can have as many Jedis as you want in the Star Wars universe. In other words, you can have as many peacekeepers, as many holders of light as you want. But on the dark side, you can only have two. There is a limited number, there's limited power in the dark side. Islamically, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there is no, we live in a time globally, we really are very affected by Christian aqidah. And Christian aqidah has at its heart a fight going on between good and evil. There is this concept that God and the devil are fighting for our souls. And that's a lot of our, the English canon, you have Harry Potter, what's going on with Harry Potter? Harry Potter, I mean, I'm a Harry Potter fan too, not to really blow everyone's mind here, but... Um, but in Harry Potter, you have good is against evil, and they're not sure who's going to win. And the same thing in Star Wars. There's this good against evil, who's going to win. In fact, if you look at almost any novel written or movie made in Western culture, there is an underlying good against evil, unless it's a romance novel. There's an underlying good against evil plot going on where both are powerful and you don't know who's going to win. It makes for good reading. It makes a good movie. But... Aqidah-wise, come sit over here. Aqidah-wise, it isn't the same as the way a Muslim is supposed to think. Aqidah-wise, Muslims know that there is no such, there is no fight. There is no fight between good and evil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah kabir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-adil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-qawi, the strong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the one uh, fighting, the one he created, shaitan, for power. This is a critical and important point as we move into the next step of what we're going to talk about today. And the critical, important point of this is like a party. Everybody that I know, mashallah. <laughs> um, the critical, important point here is that shaitan is weak. You want to squish over here? You don't have to. If you can't, you can't. Sorry, I don't mean to disturb everybody. Stay on this side, though. Don't, like, like. All right, I'm going to, I won't, I will stop micromanaging the room. <laughs> the basic point is that shaitan is weak. Shaitan is not strong. And we as Muslims have to be careful because we have a tendency to swallow the Western ideas of shaitan and start to believe that shaitan is strong, that we are listening to shaitan, that we are obeying, shaitan, that shaitan has a hold of us, that there's some kind of power in shaitan, that shaitan is indeed the Sith. Shaitan is not the Sith, using the Star Wars metaphor. The Sith are just human beings who are overcome with their own problems. We'll get to them in a minute. But is in this point of good versus evil, as Muslims, we need to really, really deeply understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is strong, the only one who is strong. And Allah is al-khaliq al-musawwir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates. So all and every that is a creation is less. And that includes shaitan. Shaitan is nothing 
Shaitan is nothing. We build when we get we get, we are the ones who build shaitan up, and we put muscles on shaitan, give him shaitan steroids, and uh, give him not lightsabers, death stars, and give him all this power over us. Because when we when we create this space for him, as the rest of the world has done. So as Muslims, it's an important point to remember and keep in mind. Shaitan is powerful. Allah subhanahu wa taala is powerful. Okay. So in this world of Jedi and Sith, then back to Jedi's and Siths, uh, we, have a, we don't have a balance of power, even in the movie, which is interesting because most movies are far more based on Christian theology than other types of religions. But Lucas was much more ecumenical. And so we can look at this and say, yeah, there, there are many more Jedi's than there are Siths. But what happens even in the movie, for those who haven't seen it, what happens even in the movie is that the Sith is big and really ugly. And one of the, I mean, I like it. The thing about those first three movies is that from the beginning to the end of the last three, the Sith and the Sith's partner gets uglier and uglier and uglier which is all about the ugliness of the inside coming out. But most importantly, as a viewer of the movie of Star Wars, or as Muslims viewing our lives, we can begin to think about there is much more good in this world than there is evil. And one of the, the worst situations to fall into is to become really afraid of evil. And as Muslims, we have no cause to be afraid, even of the thing that looks the worst. And so, again, in the movie, the Sith, it's the, the big empire, emperor who is this ugly Sith with his partner Sith who looks like the devil. He has little horns. In the first three, he has horns, and he's painted red, and, he, and everyone's wondering who he is, and he's killing people with his red, uh, red lights, lightsaber. But the, the reality is, He's just one. And, just, and as ugly as they get, as ugly as they get, in each mo movie progressively, there are those who learn how to overcome them. So in the concept of leadership, today's talk is about leadership and lightsabers. As Muslims, we, if we want to go back and think about what does it mean to be a leader as a Muslim, leadership, ha there are, if you want to study leadership, you're going to look at two different, either you're going to look at business leadership, which will give you all sorts of different leadership theories. You're going to talk about authentic leadership. You're going to talk about uh, transformative leadership. You can talk about servant leadership. The, in America, everyone wants to talk about servant leadership. Is that what you have? Is that exciting here? Does everyone talk about servant leadership here? No? In America, it's like the thing. Everyone thinks it's the new thing. Oh, mashallah. And Muslims, too, they're like, mashallah, that person is a servant leader. And the thing is, all these theories, they want to say, mashallah, the Prophet, وسلم, he was a servant leader. I'm like, what? No, we don't take our theories about leadership and apply them on the Prophet ﷺ. We look at the Prophet ﷺ and we try to understand what leadership is. We look at Ashab and Nabi ﷺ and we try to think from them, how should we be as leaders? We look at the Tabi'een and those who came after them and wonder how should we be as leaders. We don't take our modern theories and apply them. Servant leadership is a very Christian idea. And by the way, I'm not, there's, there are many lovely things in servant leadership. There really are, as far as a, as a theory. There are many lovely things, but it's not, and no theory is complete. But today we're going to try to find a Muslim theory of leadership that finds itself with little legs in Star Wars. <laughs> so if we think about leadership as Muslims now, let's step away from Star Wars for just a minute. Of course, as Muslims, the first and most important human being that we look to is our prophet. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak alayh. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who was he? Huh. My guess is if I opened up everyone's head with my own Jedi mind tricks and looked inside of all of your heads, I would discover that none of you really know. Because for the most part, we have been taught that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, uh, well, um, hmm, okay, he received the wahi, this happened to him, this thing he did, he led this thing, he did this thing, but who was he? Who was he really? 
We all know quite well the events of Sirah because that's how we teach it and that's how we write about it. But who was the Prophet Sallallahu How did he think? And what were the kinds of things that he did? And how did he interact with people? How did he in fact lead people? Did he lead them? We have all sorts of different examples of leadership today in our mosques. We have leadership that is really backwards and obnoxious and nobody really wants to go there. We all pretend like it's okay and we're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And people laugh behind the backs of those uh, leaders. They're imams from some, probably my generation, an older generation, and everyone's thinking, eh, you know, they don't really get us. Those leaders, they think none of us are watching Star Wars. Oh, we're all watching Star Wars. Um, the, or we have leadership where today, and in America, I think in the UK as well, we have this terrible, ugly, ugly vomiting of spiritual abuse amongst leaders, which is, of course, slamming doors of the mosque. No one wants to go to a mosque when you're afraid that there might be spiritual abuse in that place. So when we're looking at our own leadership that is today, we don't really necessarily see examples of what it might have meant to be the Prophet ﷺ. And when we look at our books and how our books write about who he was, we don't learn who he was. If I were to ask anyone here to list, excuse me, the miracles of Rasulullah, I bet everyone would say, the Qur'an. That's true, the Qur'an. The Qur'an is not the miracle of the Prophet ﷺ, of the man Muhammad. The Qur'an is the miracle of his role as a prophet. As Jesus السلام, and Musa السلام, and the other prophets had a miracle. The Prophet وسلم, had miracles every single day. When the Prophet وسلم, opened his mouth and made dua for someone, it came true. When he said, uh, Ya Allah, there's one of the companions, Salama, his name was. He said, the, Ya Allah, let us enjoy him for a while. That's the dua. Let us enjoy him for a while. He said about himself later, they enjoyed me for a long time, and I was the last to die of the Sahaba. Hey, the Prophet was, uh, his, his words were, were more than gold. His words were more than, than light something. His dua happened. Sa'ad and Abu Waqqas. He asked, in the, he said, Ya Allah, let his dua be answered. He had an answered dua for the rest of his life. Ya Allah, let his arrow meet its mark. He never would shoot an arrow, but that it would meet his mark. These are all miracles of Rasulullah. What about when he would put, uh, he, the time he had dates, he put them on the floor, they were the size of a baby goat. And they, the dates themselves fed over 400 hungry men. And what is that? What is that? Who was this man? What kind of leadership is this? What kind of blessed leadership was this? That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in touching something, in saying a gentle word, would change the very future of the people that he met. One of the men came to him as an assassin, a literal assassin. He came near to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm just going around the Kaaba. He put his hand on his chest, and the man said, before the Prophet's hand touched my chest, he was the most hated of all men to me. But when he removed it, he was the most beloved of all men to me. Jedi mind trick. Okay, for those of you who are like freaked out about that, it's also a joke, okay? It's not really a Jedi mind trick. Allahumma salli wa sallam barik ali. The Prophet ﷺ was in leadership, something we can't even imagine. That his own self, in just touching someone, would change them. In one sentence, he would change the future of a human being. When somebody else came to him, and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I want to go and see my flock of sheep. And he said to him, it is as though I see you. It is as though I see you. Uh, coming back from there, limping, and your wife has been captured, and your sheep have been killed, and all these kinds of things. And the guy says, the guy went anyway, and exactly happened as he said. And he's, the guy said, I wonder at myself. The Prophet said, it is as though I see you, and I went anyway. But 
but wait a minute, let's think about this as leadership. The Prophet said, it is as though I see you, but he didn't say, don't go. He didn't say, don't do it. Uh, Thaliba used to be known as the dove of the mosque. He came to the Prophet and he said, make dua that I'm rich. The Prophet said, ask me for something else. Remember, though they knew and understood if the Prophet made dua for you with something, it was real. Make dua that I'm rich. He said, ask me for something else. He said, oh, come on. He didn't actually say it like that, but you know. Make dua that I'm rich. Prophet said, ask me for something else. He said, no, la, make dua that I'm rich. So he made dua for him that he would become rich. And he began, first, he had a few sheep. As those few sheep began to increase, he was called the dove of the mosque, Thalba. Why the dove of the mosque? Because he hung around the mosque all the time. As the sheep began to increase, he first, he started missing for prayers in the mosque. Not missing them, just missing them in the mosque. Then, as his wealth increased, he began to miss the Fard Friday prayer. The Prophet said, where is Thalaba? Where is Thalaba? Until finally, Thalaba refused to pay zakat. For those who don't know, refusal to pay zakat is kufr. But the Prophet ﷺ, when Thalaba said, make dua for me, he didn't say, forget you, buddy. I know better than you. He said, ask me for something else. And when he insisted, he gave him what he wanted. This is a very interesting type of leadership. This is an empowering leadership. When Safiya, may Allah be pleased with her, married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she came to him and she said that uh, the wives of the Prophet are teasing her. He didn't go to Aisha radiallahu anha and tell her, eh, why are you teasing Sophia? Why are you making fun of her for being Jewish, for being from this Jewish tribe? Why are you making fun of her? Instead, he gave her words that would empower her. He said, tell them, my father is Moses, and my uncle is Harun, and my husband is Muhammad. And he go tell them that your status, and of course for the Arabs, your family is very important. Go tell them where your status is. And he, he empowered her and gave her words of power. This is a very different type of leadership than what we see today. If we look at because the metaphor of the Jedi with this weak looking lightsaber, what is this thing? It's nothing compared to the weapons of that time. But if we look at what the Prophet ﷺ gave people, it's so quiet that we don't see it. What he gave people is so quiet we don't study it. We don't look at it. We don't even notice that it's there. He gave people what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. He gave us choice. He, he gave us the ability to choose khair. He gave us the ability to choose to be of the best ummah on the face of the earth. Even in his time. There wasn't any coercion. There wasn't mocking. There wasn't uh, making fun of. There wasn't yelling at. There wasn't uh, forced anything. There wasn't... It wasn't not in any stage of the da'wah do we see anything that looks like anything unethical or even anything forced. It's really quite amazing. It's really amazing. Instead, his person was so full of light that people were falling over each other to please him. Falling over each other and hoping and wishing to please the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What can we do to have you smile at us? And this was the power of leadership of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab, we know about him. If we talk about him, we think, oh, he was a man of incredible justice. We know this. But yet, if we really think about who he was, he followed in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a person who he didn't sleep in the night and he didn't sleep in the day. And when they asked him why, he said, if I sleep in the day, 
I fear that the responsibilities, my responsibilities for what Allah has given me to carry, that I've left them to the side. And I, if I sleep at night, then my responsibilities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I have left to the side. He would say, if a goat trips in Baghdad, in a, in a village near Baghdad, if a goat trips because I wasn't careful with the bridge, Allah will hold me accountable for it. Yani, where is this leadership that we have today? What kind of leadership do we have today? We, have, we, instead, we don't have leadership today. We have, we have arrogance today. We have, we, maybe we even have just sort of Siths. What is a Sith in the movie? A Sith is someone who started walking on the road of light, but went inside themselves and chose arrogance, fear, and anger, and bitterness, and ugly feelings over what is good and khair and beautiful. And in choosing that, switched. Switched from everything that was good to everything that was ugly. But also in choosing that, shrunk. This is an important part of the movie. More importantly, it's an important part of how we understand what it means to be a human being. When we choose what is ugly, we become ugly on the inside. And more importantly, we become of those who can't, how we, we bring our ceiling down. Hey, the ceiling that is open, we can, be of, we can be of people that are really unbelievable. We bring that ceiling down and we slam it right above our heads. When we choose bitterness, when we choose ugliness, and when we choose uh, fear and anger and arrogance. Leadership is in following Omar and in following the Prophet Sallallahu is clear. What about a woman? Do we have any women examples of leaders? There are many, but I'm going to give one from West Africa. Nana Asma'u. Have you heard of Nana Asma'u? Some of you would have heard of her by now, alhamdulillah. Nana Asma'u was a woman in uh, West Africa. She lived during the Sokoto Khalifa, for those of you who know about the Sokoto Khalifa. And her father was Osman Danfodio. He was a great, uh, incredible sheikh and leader. But I want to talk about her because I want to talk about her as a Jedi leader. Her, she did something that was incredible. She looked at her society and there were thousands of new converts. And she was really afraid that those con they were brand new and there wasn't any Google, no smartphones. And they really didn't have access to Islamic knowledge. Most of them spoke another language. And there weren't even books written about Islam in the, in the language that they spoke. And what was going to happen to the next generation? She had real anxiety, positive anxiety, the kind of anxiety Muhammad Iqbal talks about in his poetry. Anxiety for the good of Islam. She had real anxiety for Islam and the Muslims that were to come. What is she going to do? They're not coming to her. It's too difficult. How will she send them teachers? And she invents an entirely new pedagogical practice and sends teachers out. What she did, I'm going to tell you the details of it because it's a Jedi trick. She brought together she brought together pairs of women. There, uh, one woman would be over 40 because it would be past childbearing age. And the other woman, woman would be pre-childbearing age, about 12. Like literally a 12-year-old and a 40-year-old. She brought them to her and she taught them. She wrote a whole curriculum in, poem, in rhyme, in the language of the people. And she taught them these long poems that had within them Islamic knowledge. Then she paired them up and sent them off into the, into the bush, into, the, into these villages that you couldn't get to them during the rainy season. So they would go, stay there, and then come back after the rainy season was over. They'd go before and come, out, come back after. There was one more thing she did that, that bl it's blow your mind creativity. The, they were people who knew nothing about Islam, and they were used to respecting a medicine woman. That medicine woman was from the animist religion. And uh, she used to dress with, she had a hat, like a straw hat that she would wear. She would come into town with a straw hat. And so, Nana Asma'u got the same straw hat 
put a ribbon around it and put it on top of the hijabs of these new teachers that she was sending so they would look familiar. They didn't look exactly the same, but they looked familiar to the women in those villages. And she sent them out to teach. These women held on to that learning for over, over 150 years. And I believe you can say even until today, but I don't have proof of that. There's still a movement called the Yantero movement, though, so I, I guess I do have proof of it. Her movement was called the Yantero movement. Nana Asma'u embodied very much the leadership of Rasulullah sallallahu and Umar ibn al-Khattab and the Tabi'een. Why? Because she cared deeply about Muslim people. She was open-minded and creative. And she was non-stop hard work to make sure that her vision was able to practically happen, that, it would ha that her vision would occur amongst the people. In, uh, there is a letter that was written between Nana Asma'u and the sheikh of her time in Arabic. He wrote her a letter. And when he wrote to her, he wrote to her and he, he was complimenting her on her scholarship and complimenting her on who she was. And he said to her, you are indeed the mujaddida of this time. The mujaddideen is the Prophet Wasallam said that every hundred, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care of this religion, right? So whether we help or whether we hurt or whether we just sit on our butts and do nothing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take care of this religion. But how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of the religion? He sends every hundred years, men yujaddid deenukum, one who will renew your religion. So this scholar wrote to her and said, you are indeed the mujaddida of this era. She doesn't refuse. She doesn't say, no, nah, no, no, I'm not. She says, MashaAllah. She says nice words back to him, basically, MashaAllah. But so, in connecting us to the movie, if you take the word Mujaddideen, huh? Right? Mu Jedi Deen. Right? All of us really need to be the unlimited number of mujaddideen in this time. This concept of what she was and who she was and what she did so far away from Mecca and Medina, so far away from the culture of Mecca, the culture of Medina, what had been done there before. And yet, she brought back to life Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, Ali. May Allah be pleased with them all. She brought back to life the Ummahat al-Nabi, Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, excuse me, Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the Azwaj al-Nabi, the mothers of the believers. She brought back to life every leader that we had had before. In her, if we, if we I think she was a mujaddida of her time and era, because she, she flipped everything upside down. And we see the effects of it today. We live in a difficult time. We live as Muslims in a difficult time. It's a time when we feel frustrated and overwhelmed by the darkness around us outside of our community and inside of our community. We're frustrated by lack of leadership. We're frustrated by poor leadership. And we're frustrated by what seems to be things that we can do nothing about, that we have no control over, not only no control over, but as though we can do nothing. We are like the Jedis with just a little lightsaber. We don't have a Death Star. We don't have anything that feels strong enough to overcome the darkness that we are in. If we're not afraid for ourselves, we're afraid for the next generation. And if we're not afraid for the next generation, then we're really not paying attention. And yet, if, so if we think about ourselves as mujaddideen, as the Jedis of this time, and we think about and ask ourselves, do I hold and carry a lightsaber? Do I have on my belt the weapon of light for this time? To ask ourselves, what is it? What is that light? What can it be? What is it that I, what, the lightsaber did a couple of things, if you remember correctly. One of the most important jobs of the lightsaber is that you, if you hold it up, anyone shooting at you, you just, you, you just go, and all of the 
the shootings at you, whatever they're shooting, is defended away. It's crazy. Anything. <laughs> Big old uh, shooting from whole starships to anything. <laughs> So the first thing we need is the, is the lightsaber that is a shield. That is a shield from problematic aqidah. That is a shield from arrogance. That is a shield from fear. That is a shield from the darkness of this time. And not a fake shield. Let's talk about the fake shield for a minute. There's this fake shield where we all pretend we're religious. You know, we're all like, mashallah. I wear hijab. Mashallah, I have a beard. I don't have a beard, alhamdulillah. <laughs> but we have this performative way of being a Muslim. But everyone who performs Islam also has imposter syndrome and is afraid of being found out one day. That is not a lightsaber life. A lightsaber life is, begins with honesty. It begins with honesty between the self and God. Because in the end, being a Muslim is not, I do not, I do not agree with the political movement. OK, let me be careful here. I think that the political movement to turn Muslims into an identity is very dangerous. Because we run the very scary possibility that we forget that we're not an identity. We're a faith. We're a faith. If we're fighting for the right to be a Muslim, but we're not praying, what, what is that? Why we, what, what? If we're fighting every day for the right to fast Ramadan, to have Eid in our school, to have Eid in the schools for our children, but we're not fasting, mashallah. MashaAllah. If we're fighting out Muslim, 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 is, are we, and what, is, what, is, what nationality is Muslim? It's American. Because <laughs> I'm American. And I'm Muslim. I, I have a, one of my students, her name is Michelle. And uh, it, she says, if somebody asks her, why don't you change your name? She says, I have a Muslim name. They say, oh, you do? Yeah, it's Michelle, and I'm a Muslim. Because it's not a performance. It's not a change of the name. Being a Muslim is a life. It's a choice. It's a relationship between us and God first and foremost. And if we don't have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to stop and just take a minute. And pretending and being fake and creating this big thing about, oh, yeah, yeah. It's not, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The first thing the lightsaber does is it creates a shield. It creates a shield from that which stops us from having, which kills the spirit, let's put it that way. And that which kills the spirit is everything that takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing the lightsaber does is it's capable of fighting off that which comes to threaten us. The only thing, the only thing that will really fight off that which comes to threaten us is prayer. The fuddled prayer acts like a fence. So if I'm standing here, the fuddled prayer is a fence around me. As long as I'm praying all of them, I'm safe. I can walk over there. I can walk over there. I can go, I can go anywhere because I have the prayer around me. But the day that I miss Fajr or Aisha or Dhuhr, or asr, or any fuddled prayer, I've opened the gate. And the second you open the gate, you better say, ahla wa sahla. Welcome to all of that that can hurt me. And if we're not going to take our prayers seriously, then we should really be ready for, some, for, uh, for a space where the Jedi becomes the Sith. Close your gate. And protect your gate with nawafid. You can protect your. So if I have my gate of the fuddled prayers and I put around it nawafid, tahajjud, sunnah prayers, duha, awabin, reading Quran, extra stuff, then what happens? The day that I miss one of those, I still have a gate. I still have a gate. If I miss a tahajjud here, oh, alhamdulillah, I prayed fashion. 
But if I'm only expecting to wake up for Fajr, God forbid. And that wasn't the way of the Prophet Sallallahu by the way. Nor was it the way of the companions. Nor was it the way of the Tabi'een. Nor was it the way of any of the Mujaddideen. Nor was it the way of any of our greatest Muslims. Just to leave Fajr? No. If I, if I, leave, if I open the gate of Hajj, then I have Fajr to protect me. If I remove the Nawafil, I have nothing. And if I miss one thing, I'm open. I'm open for the, the Sith of the world and the ugliness of the world to come and attack me. And this is the state of the Muslims today. We are in a crisis of prayer. I'm not going to ask you, but if I were to ask you, I would imagine that if I ask, is there anyone here who is not, not asking, don't put your hands up. I have anyone here who has not missed a fuddled prayer in the last two years, my guess would be no one's hand would go up. La hawru la illa billah. In the room of people who've come to hear a Muslim woman speak about Islam. What about the rest of us? As a crisis, we are in a prayer crisis. As a Muslim ummah, the percentage of Muslims who don't miss the prayer, it's tiny. It's tiny. Yet the Prophet when he was called upon to pray to Hajjud by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, what was he told? Get up and pray to Hajjud, why? Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that maybe is the wrong word, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise you to maqaman mahmuda, a praised status. Huh? Hello, Muslims, all of us. We have to like put the mirror in front of our head and go, Bleh. we look at the status of Muslims around the world. Where, are we at a praised status? MashaAllah. As an ummah, who do you know that wants to be us? Who do you know that says, oh, I wish I was born into a Muslim family. And the converts come to Islam because our aqidah is clean, not because they want to enter our communities. May Allah help us. But if we were praying to Hajjud, I'm talking about Hajjud, not, not the Fadl. To Hajjud, our ummah would be at a praised status. Maqaman mahmuda. That's where we would be. But we're not there. We're not, any, we're not even close to Jedi status. We're maybe younglings. Maybe. Maybe. Padawans? Eh. Maybe a few Padawans. It's actually really a serious thing to think about. That in our community, we have five pillars. Muslims, Muslims the one thing that Muslims, mashallah, they don't pray, they don't eat anything, but they don't eat pork. MashaAllah. I used to know when I was in college, I knew this Kuwaiti guy, and he drank, he didn't pray, he had girlfriends, he had, but he did not eat pork. No. We're, I don't know why we're so afraid of it. You know, alhamdulillah, like I'm not encouraging it, alhamdulillah. But like, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Like, what, what happened to us that we're like, no. And in England, it's really funny because in England, in the United States, we have different madhabs and different ethnicities. But in England, like, also, People don't eat except for zabiha, right? So like people don't pray, and maybe they don't even fast, and maybe they drink, but is the meat zabiha? And okay, you guys aren't laughing, so that's not funny to you, but it's funny to me because it's uh, it's such a weird thing. But if you think about it, like why is it that we and alhamdulillah, look, alhamdulillah, food is important. It changes our very cells. Alhamdulillah that we hold on to this. But my question is, why did this become important and prayer did not? My question is, how did that become the thing that is the one thing we don't break? Alhamdulillah, we don't break it. But prayer did not. When of the five pillars of Islam, it doesn't say don't eat pork. It says pray. It says fast. It says, pay zakat. It says, go on hajj if you can. And say, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammad rasulullah. And please, nobody misunderstand me. I'm not at all, of course, of course, I'm not belittling the decision or the, the blessing that at least we have this one thing that we don't do. I'm just wondering, what happened to the prayer? What happened to the prayer? And if we want to be of those who are truly standing in leadership, because the, and the last thing I'll say is that there is a place of leadership that we're not even thinking about. And that is that Maqam al Mahmudan place. The place of leadership that we are called to be in. We are called to be of the Khulafa. 
of those who are left on this earth to represent, if you will, to be responsible for, for representing Allah's laws and rules on this earth. To stand in that place of light. To be responsible not only in our own communities, but for everyone around us. To be caring for in a beautiful, joyful, lovely, uplifting, lit way. Lit as in light way. Yeah. But we're not, we're not even, we're so bogged down with our own problems, we don't know how to fix our own mosques, much less the problem of hunger in the world. We have racism inside of our mosques, much less taking up the banner of fixing racism in the societies we live in. We have sexism in our own families, much less standing up and carrying, and carrying you know, signs and taking care of a society and uplifting women in our societies that we have been given to as the responsibility. So if we go back to the metaphor of the Jedis and we think of them as the Mujaddideen of this time, and we think of that lightsaber that we're all carrying, and we use it to fend off and use it to bring forth khair and light and goodness. Then we'll see in that lightsaber our prayer, our ibadah, and one, the last thing, and our sense of responsibility that is tied to a good attitude. Because if you have a sense of responsibility, but you're nothing but a crank, I don't really want your, you know what a crank is here in this country? If you're nothing but like really, you know, mm, cranky, always have a nasty look on your face. What do you call cranks here? Grumps. Grumps. But you're nothing but a grump. Then, we don't, then, it, then you can't carry the responsibility. Because bringing light to people in, insists on bringing joy to people. Leading people to light insists on joy and happiness. Otherwise, it's not light. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just fake. It's plastic. It's not real. Allahumma salli wa sallam barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make each one of you, especially those of you in school of economics and politics, if you're thinking about that, and everyone from everywhere else too, um, the leaders of tomorrow, like for real, the real mujaddideen of this religion. Those really holding the metaphorical lightsaber that we really need. Like we're waiting, we're waiting. My generation is done now. They're waiting for this next generation to come forth with real work and real light and real changes to really uplift our community, inshallah. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Al-Fatiha. Keep the faith.